Well, today we're going to be talking about uh, hat chip set. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the famous female pharaoh. And we're going to go into quite a few other topics as well along the way. So uh, let's go ahead and, and, and get started. Now, um, be before we do, let's give a, a little bit of context of women in uh, ancient Egypt. Now, uh, I don't want to do any sort of revisionism and say that, you know, men and women were absolutely uh, treated equally and it's an egalitarian society and, you know, I'm not going to idealize it. Yet at the same time, I want to make it very clear that uh, in theory, uh, and what we see from the evidence, women did have a lot in the way of rights. Um, and um, shared some of the same kinds of positions uh, that men did occupy to a certain extent at all, right? There's lots of exceptions, but, um, you know, so you still have the gendered roles, so to speak. But I do want to make it also clear that um, Egypt uh, changes throughout time. Uh, you have starting the pre-dynastic period uh, into the Old Kingdom, into the Middle Kingdom. Um, when it comes to women and men, there seems to be quite a bit uh, of, of equality that we see in evidence. And then with the arrival of the Hyksos during the second intermediate period, uh, you're going to have a shift because the Semitic Hyksos are very patriarchal. Uh, and when they move into Egypt, after they do what they do, and there is a significant uh, amount of destruction, there's also a lot of transition. Uh, the new kingdom definitely is more patriarchal uh, than the, uh, than the, um, uh, the earlier periods. And so, however, Hatshepsut, happens to be from uh, this New Kingdom period. So she is, in a sense, dealing with this a little bit of a different paradigm uh, to a certain extent. But even that, having said that, by the time we get to the arrival of the Greeks into Egypt around 332 BCE, um, I got to tell you that... Uh, the the Greeks, uh, Greek women were not treated very well. And what we have from the extent sources, and we have a lot of have sources, Egyptian women are treated very well, uh, even during that period of time, uh, even during that context. They definitely were allowed uh, more uh, privileges and rights uh, than Greek women who are living uh, in Egypt at this time. Uh, we do have quite a bit in the way of sources. Uh, you know, the Egyptian desert preserves so much in the way of, of writings. Uh, of course, you have papyrus and uh, the dry um, missions. You have, of course, these preserves of these writings. So we have not just uh, you know, manuscripts and religious texts, but we have personal letters and receipts and other paraphernalia uh, that you ordinarily would not have uh, in other climates. So we do have a lot of evidence when it comes to women in Egypt. Uh, taking a look at this, uh, even by the time of the Hellenistic age in Egypt, uh, women could uh, own property. Uh, they could own, uh, not only own uh, property and manage it, but they could sell it. Uh, property, of course, obviously includes land, uh, portable goods, uh, slaves, uh, livestock, right? Uh, so they have that ability. Um, women, we do know, uh, were, uh, could be part of legal disputes in exactly the same way uh, as men resolve uh, legal settlements. Uh, so uh, when it comes to um, uh, women were entitled to sue. Uh, so uh, if 
by themselves, right? So they don't, you don't have to have a male that sues in representation for them. No, they can sue. Uh, so there's a lot of freedom there. Um, in, Egyptian women, obviously, you could have independent businesses. Uh, they had quite a few. Uh, in fact, there is evidence that um, one-fourth to one-third of all businesses in Egypt by the time we get to the Hellenistic era uh, were owned by women, owned by women. So that's that's pretty remarkable. Women uh, could be in charge of, of uh, not just uh, uh, in charge of a, a large farm or a small farm or, or a business. They could be even the boss over various manufacturing companies, their ceramics and and obviously um, uh, making of textiles, women could have that kind of position. Uh, women uh, in ancient Egypt could employ uh, men uh, under them. Uh, and so you it could be a so there could be a female boss over many men. You know, it's interesting because this was not just uh, in Egypt, but uh, throughout the region of, of uh, even going into the Middle East and even to Arabia. You do have to remember, and I'll tell you, if people don't remember this, is that Khadija, uh, who was the, the wife of Muhammad, remember that she was uh, an independent businesswoman uh, that uh, traded uh, throughout the Middle East, and she was the one who hired Muhammad to work for her alongside other men. So this is not just in Egypt, but other places uh, in the Middle East. So there you have it. Um, women, of course, came with their dowry. Uh, and in the event of a divorce, they took their dowry with them. Uh, now, when the husband died, uh, or he divided up the property uh, into three parts. I mean, by three parts, so you're thinking, okay, so one third, um, you know, you know, um, obviously went uh, well. See, three parts, uh, but um, uh, and sometimes, of course, it went obviously to her, it went to the children, and it went to uh, the relatives of the husband. What I find is interesting, however, in the case of, of divorce, uh, you still have the division uh, in threes, uh, one third to the husband, one third to the wife, and one third uh, to the children. I find that very interesting. Okay. So um, when it comes to marriage, now you think the Egyptians, there's, you know, you know religion permeates everything in life. It does. But did you know there's not an Egyptian word for the word uh, wedding? What? Uh, so there was no ceremony per se. Now, there could be, but it was not mandated. Uh, so basically, getting married simply means moving into that person's house. Getting a divorce uh, could be as easy as just moving out of the person's house which is interesting. Now, there was no age limit when it comes to marriage, but it was always after uh, menstruation. Uh, there, is no, there was no rings that were exchanged. Uh, there was no special bridal clothing. Uh, there was no change of name to indicate that they were married. Uh, it's, it's fascinating uh, that, that uh, a belief, you know, a, a society that is so steep in tradition of all types when it comes to marriage was a little bit um, not uh, as as formal uh, so divorce was strictly a, a private matter right uh, and uh, it um, uh, it could be said just uh, on on the say of one of the people that are not satisfied uh, they basically said uh, they were out uh, and that was it, right? It's like, whoa. Okay, so now, uh, having said that, pregnancy was a big deal. Um, and it, this is where we're moving into another category altogether. Now, when a woman became pregnant, 
And that was something that was very important. Uh, and there is this idea that the more children that one has, the, the more important uh, that person would be, uh, that woman would be. Uh, in Egypt, you did have polygamy. You did have multiple marriages and so uh, multiple wives. And it doesn't seem to work the other way uh, in this particular society. However, uh, uh, you know, at the same time, you know, you have, uh, um, you have, of course, uh, different, different forms in a sense of, of, of the marital situation. You always have that first wife uh, who has it's a more degree over some of the other wives. You do seem to have that. And that kind of brings it in uh, to the pharaonic uh, context. So, um, but, you know, uh, we do have other bits and pieces here and there, uh, but I just want to mention, so this is kind of the context of, of ancient Egypt. Oh, by the way, um, the mother named her child immediately following birth, uh, making sure that the child would have a name uh, in case there was, you know, because uh, a name was important in connection to uh, dying early. They have a name so they will not be lost the underworld. So that's a little bit of context of women uh, in ancient Egypt. Obviously, there's changes throughout time uh, between the, the old kingdom, middle kingdom, new kingdom, and moving into the Hellenistic age. But I would say, in short, in general, women, uh, unlike uh, the Greeks, uh, did uh, enjoy more in the way of rights and privileges, and at least on paper, uh, they were accorded equal rights uh, for the most part. Now, uh, Hetjutset was not the first uh, pharaoh that was a female pharaoh. Uh, there is a precedent for that, and we're going to go into that uh, right now. Uh, one of the earliest uh, women uh, that uh, attained a position of authority uh, in Egypt um, was one of them, his name is called Neith Hotep. Neith Hotep, uh, she thrived uh, around 3100, 3100 BCE. Uh, so this began a precedent of powerful women in Egypt. Uh, and of course, uh, at first they thought uh, that uh, she was the wife of Narmer, uh, the very first king of the first dynasty uh, and the mother of Hor Aha. But uh, uh, we have now realized now that, uh, taking a look at the archaeology, that she was actually the wife of the second pharaoh of the first dynasty. She was the wife of Hor uh, And she was co-regent uh, with their son, Didger, uh, who happened to be uh, too young uh, to take the throne when Hor Aha died. And so uh, as a result of that, uh, she gained power. And so she was the one in authority because obviously uh, Didger was too young. Uh, it's interesting, we find evidence of this. There's, a, there's an inscription uh, of Didger, which shows a procession of all these uh, festive boats. And uh, uh, at the right, uh, it shows a royal uh, Serik, uh, royal Serik, uh, basically, that is, uh, it's before a cartouche, but it's kind of a, a rectangular uh, square that has a horse on top, and that's what you write things inside anyway. But what happens is this, is that in this particular uh, image, uh, you, there's Victor's name uh, is inside, so it's protected by the sacred boundary, just like we later on see with a cartouche. Uh, we see, of course, the horse falcon on top, as I mentioned. Uh, and the Sarek, um, sorry, the, um, the, the falcon holds a war mace <laughs> in which it's, it's, it's clubbing uh, a, a kneeling foe to death. Uh, this is not uh, a pleasant sight. But uh, anyway, Nithotep's name appears at the left uh, in a diagonal sense, showing her association uh, with her son, uh, Didger, uh, and of course, me with, uh, sorry, with the, uh, uh, with the, um, yeah, and of course, obviously, uh, being connected to uh, Hor Aha. So, now, 
uh, it, what is also interesting that I want to bring up is the fact that uh, uh, the ancient Egyptians, before the pyramids, you had what's called mastabas. And mastabas, what they would do, these are just kind of made out of brick, mud brick sometimes, but what they would do, these are like steps. And uh, they put one, uh, and these, these are tombs. They sometimes had two chambers, one for the treasures and one for uh, the, the body. And then as time went on, they put one mastaba on top of another mastaba on top of another mastaba. And so you start getting uh, these steps that will eventually become a step pyramid. But uh, during this period of time of the first dynastic, uh, sorry, during the uh, first dynasty, excuse me, uh, you're going to have um, these gigantic mastabas that are burial places uh, for the pharaoh. Well, what happens is they found this giant mastaba, and it was dedicated to her and not one of the, the male pharaohs because she already is taking on these reigns of power. And so she is, uh, becomes a full queen of Egypt. Uh, you know, and there's a few reasons why we know that she's a full queen of Egypt. First of all, she appears on several clay seal impressions uh, located inside a serac which, by the way, uh, this was reserved exclusively, this practice, for a Egyptian ruler. So her name appears within this proto um, um, kind of um, cartouche, the Serac, right? Second, her tomb uh, is that indeed of an Egyptian king. Uh, in fact, it includes cultic features that were exclusively used uh, for the pharaohs. And third, of course, uh, there is uh, discovered an inscription from the Wadi Amera area, and Nithotep uh, is said arranged and ordered an expedition uh, through the Wadi in attempt to mine ore and harvest feedstocks. Uh, this is as an in, in the independent order. So there's evidence that she made this order independently. Um, of her own volition. So again, uh, you have uh, her name uh, being that of showing uh, through the iconography, that of a ruler. Uh, second of all, uh, she does have the traditional tomb of an Egyptian king. And third of all, there's evidence of her exacting orders. So there he is. So, so uh, it's interesting. I just want to talk about uh, Neith a little bit. Um, now, uh, Neith Hotep, of course, you see the name Neith. Neith was actually a goddess of war and hunting. You're going to see her name coming about again. Uh, and um, uh, it's interesting that uh, she is definitely a fierce deity that is not oftentimes talked about. Uh, she is represented as a woman who wears a red crown, uh, and she's Known as holding a bow and arrow. Sometimes she's shown uh, with a harpoon, which I think is, is rather interesting, right? And very complex a goddess, uh, yet uh, uh, Neith was considered uh, at this time uh, one of the eldest of the gods. Uh, and uh, when there was a dispute between Horus and Seth that we see, uh, especially going into the Old Kingdom period, uh, Neith uh, is said to settle these disputes. Uh, she's the arbitrator uh, in between the two. Uh, that there's a work called the Contending of Seth and Horus. Uh, and Neith here is asked by the gods, uh, understood as the most ancient of the goddesses, uh, to decide who is to rule, right? And, uh, and of course, uh, she cho chooses Horus, right? Uh, so, uh, uh, Neith uh, also uh, makes a threat that if you don't choose Horus, if you don't agree with my decision, I will cause the, the sky, she says, to crash to the earth. <laughs> uh, why is because uh, Neith uh, is understood to be one of the two pillars that supports the sky. So there's two supports of the heavens. The other is Selkit. So Selkit and Neith 
they support the sky above. And so she says, if you don't do Horus, I'm going to remove myself uh, and the sky is going to come crashing down. But the deep <coughs> is also, um, she has many roles uh, in the early dynastic period, even pre-dynastic period. Uh, she's referred to as the opener of ways. Uh, and again, uh, she's connected uh, to war. She's also connected uh, to opening these underworld pathways. Uh, so, and, 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 um, and so she's connected to the underworld as well as the overworld. Yeah. And, uh, so, so that means that this first early pharaoh that I just mentioned has quite a distinguished name, as you can imagine, right? Oh, one more little bit on Neith. You know, she is the one uh, who generates things, but she never connects to a male. And so uh, so she's kind of a, a pathogenic uh, creatrix, in a sense, uh, or autogenetic, right? She's uh, one of the earliest ones, uh, the virgin uh, that gives life uh, to the world. So you can see, uh, the reason why I bring up this illustration is you can see early on uh, some of these some of these goddesses are, are quite powerful indeed, and they do reflect the society uh, in which uh, they are the ones who are over here. Just bring that up. Okay, so uh, uh, Hotep's tomb was discovered, by the way, in, in 1897, um, and uh, was examined again in 1898. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned, it's just as gigantic Mastaba, but um, unfortunately, it's it's heavily eroded. We can't, we don't see much uh, from it, but all we know uh, is that it was of significant size. Well, the next female pharaoh that we have record of, uh, her name is Merneith. Now, I think that's interesting. You got Merneith. By the way, Mer is the ancient name for pyramids. Uh, neath, of course, you know the word neath. Uh, and so, again, that name has some significance there. Uh, now, she is the daughter of King Didger. Remember Didger? We already talked about. So that means, you know, now, so she became the senior royal wife later on Digit. But she, of course, as you can tell, was the daughter of King Didger, which means that she would be the granddaughter of Horaha, and most importantly, Nithotep. So there is this strong line uh, that is moving through, as you can see. Uh, and um, she is, um, we find um, inscriptions, various seals discovered in her son's grave, which states plainly uh, in the hieroglyphics that she is the king's mother, Merneith, uh, like her grandmother, uh, Nithotep, her name reveals a dedication to the same goddess, Neith, right? Uh, and of course, the word Merneith specifically means, however, beloved of by Neith. And so you see on her stele connections to that deity. According to many Egyptologists, what happens is that, uh, well, Egypt, um, unfortunately, uh, who is her husband, died uh, too young and, and for his son then to rule. And so Marini then ruled until she was, he was old enough uh, to take over succession. So uh, there you have it. Now, it's interesting because once again, uh, we see all these various tombs, these uh, giant tombs, and her tomb was built on the very same scale as those of the surrounding male tombs, uh, whether it be uh, Den's tomb or, 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 or Digit's tomb or otherwise. So again, uh, equal treatment there, uh, which I think fine is the fact that uh, she was even buried uh, with a 40 uh, of her servants, which of course they, you know, this is the traditional when a, when a Pharaoh is, it's time to end. Uh, the servant never ends their occupation uh, with them. They, they, you know, so if you sign up, right, that um, um, if, you, if you sign up to be a, a pharaoh, 
uh, I'm sorry, decided to work for Pharaoh, uh, what happens is that uh, uh, your, your, your job continues with them into the afterlife. And so as a result of that, um, um, you're all kind of brought into the tomb uh, and, um, and the big deal is closed up. Uh, and then you either starve to death, you do ritual suicide. In some cases we know from forensics, people panic. You know, um, you know uh, she was accorded the same uh, as everybody, as all the other pharaohs. So, oh, no, I'm not referring to any images. So I'm just a little bit under the weather. Okay. Anyway, uh, now um, what happens is that um, she was also generated with a tomb at Saqqara. So which I think is a good thing as well. The next pharaoh uh, is, the female pharaoh is Ken Kaus. Uh, she thrived around 20 feet, 2530 BCE. Uh, and she was the daughter of Pharaoh Menkar, uh, who was the builder of the smallest of the three pyramids of Giza. According to one scenario, she became the wife of Shepsefkoth, and then the mother of Userkoth. In another scenario, uh, she marries King Userkoth and becomes the mother of Surah. And Nefrakar Kaki. But the truth of the matter is, is, she gets these elaborate names. She is mother of the two dual kings. Uh, and, um, and so, uh, and she is, of course, accorded again uh, great power and prestige on her own. Uh, in fact, uh, and so we, in fact, she, her, she receives um, at Giza uh, her, own, her own pyramid. Uh, a chapel, a water tank, granaries, a valley temple, uh, and a pyramid town dedicated to her, and even a boat pit, uh, the night boat of the sun god Ra, and we think that there is another one. And it's very clear uh, by looking at the complex that she is connected uh, very much with the pharaoh Minkar, and that's, of course, her father. And there is evidence that she had a significant amount of power uh, as well. Okay, the next one, we're almost we're getting there. I'm just trying to show there is a precedent for a hatch upset. But um, I think it's interesting to go through uh, some of the female pharaohs. The next one is Nito Chris. Uh, Nito Chris, around uh, uh, 2100 BCE, uh, this is from the era of Pippa II very end of the old kingdom. This is a very uh, troubled time, full of anarchy. In fact, uh, the various uh, uh, states that Egypt is divided into, uh, these are called gnomes, uh, were in rebellion. And so those who are uh, governors are called nomarchs. And so you have constant fighting between these 42 gnomes going back and forth. According to the Turin king list, uh, a certain Mernair, um, uh, the very last king of the old kingdom, only reigned one year. And this is where we get uh, the Greek historian Herodotus, right? And he says that he was murdered and that his sister queen, Nitocris, then became queen of Egypt uh, and then sought to avenge them, uh, avenge him for you know, for, for, for the murder. Now, I find the story quite entertaining, uh, as Herodotus often is. The story goes as follows. It, it's, he says, Nitocris succeeded her brother. Uh, he had been the king of Egypt and his subjects, who then placed her upon the throne and put him to death. Determined to avenge his death, she devised a cunning scheme by which she destroyed a vast number of Egyptians. She constructed a spacious underground chamber and on pretense of inaugurating it through a banquet, inviting all those who she knew to have been responsible for the murder of her brother. Suddenly, as they were feasting, she let the river in upon them by means of a large secret duct. And according to the story, they all drowned, right? Now, of course, Herodotus continued that she committed suicide, but, you know, he gets things always mixed up. In fact, uh, it seems to be con 
confused with the Babylonian queen who's connected with Darius and her, uh, her suicide. But what happens, in fact, uh, her name, Nita Chris, was also known as Nita Ker, which means the soul of Ra uh, is divine. Uh, and, uh, and so she did exist, and she is on various lists. Um, but it's interesting because um, uh, even though she appears on various lists, um, you know, uh, she doesn't appear in others. However, Herodotus and Manetho uh, do list her as an independent uh, queen of Egypt. So here we have another one. So uh, we have Sobek Neferu. Uh, she reigned from 1806 to 1802 BCE. Again, we're going to be very careful about these dates because they slide around uh, quite a bit. Uh, and uh, But she ruled for about four years independently. Uh, she is shown on the Turin King list that she ruled three years, 10 months, and 24 days. Uh, and of course, the name means the beauty of Sobek. Uh, and so she's another uh, important individual. It, it actually, it looks like that her sister was intended, Ella's sister was intended to be uh, queen. And then what happened is, is that uh, um, she became queen instead. And of course, her name is enclosed in a cartouche in a very royal manner. Uh, she also had her own pyramid at Awara. And so, you know, it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, uh, many of her headless statues uh, have been preserved. What I find is interesting about this, and you can see why I'm bringing this up in the context of Hetchinset, uh, is that um, we see within these statues a combination of elements from a male to a female dress. So here we have a female pharaoh that's already taking on uh, the male pharaonic dress at times. And so there is a precedent uh, for, for headship sets. There is a precedent uh, as, as early uh, as we get with Sobek Neferu. So we see this. So uh, she made uh, many additions to the pyramid complex of Amun Hat III at Hawawa. Uh, she also uh, created uh, a labyrinth that is mentioned uh, by Herodotus. So, and of course, with her death, uh, the twelfth dynasty ended, and that was the that's the end of the Golden Age, the Middle Kingdom, uh, and the very weak thirteenth uh, dynasty followed. We're getting closer now. Uh, we have. Now, Ahotep the first is another female pharaoh. You're going, wow, there's quite a few. You, you, you're, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to make you realize that, wow, she is not the exception. There are so many, I guess there's so many others, but there's still some differences. Ahotep, um, she, is, um, she ruled during the end of the 17th dynasty. Uh, she was the daughter of Queen Peshera, or Peti the Small. Uh, and Sitker Ahmos. She was both the sister and wife of the pharaoh Tao, uh, T-A-O. Her name, Ahotep, means the moon is satisfied. Her title is included a great royal wife, also the associate of the white crown bearer, uh, also king's mother. And so we see this here. Now, what happens is, is that what I find fascinating is that uh, her second son, Othmos I, is fighting against the Hyksos. So this is, now we're at the end of the second um, uh, uh, intermediate period. Othmos, her son, is fighting the Hyksos, uh, which, of course, leaves, you know, remember Egypt, uh, much of it is destroyed. A lot of the monuments are, are destroyed. During this, this this time, uh, I, I do have to bring this up. The Hyksos do ravage quite a bit of damage. Why am I bringing it up? Because later on, it is Hatshepsut who is going to be rebuilding Egypt from the damage caused by the Hyksos. So we have to mention this. So, so anyway, Othmos is fighting the Hyksos. They can't always be there in Egypt. 
to watch things because he's pushing the Hyksos from Egypt uh, and into what is now the southern part of the Levant, you know, with the southern part of what is now Palestine. So who's going to be in charge? Well, guess what? Ahotep the first, she is in charge. So uh, also, uh, then he, of course, by the way, uh, also Ahotep the first, after he finishes there, she, he goes down to the south. <laughs> and he fights, uh, he leads an army against Nubia, also to expel the, the Hyksos from that region. So he, he's pretty busy, right? So while he's off in campaign, a group of Hyksos decide to attack Thebes. They're going to try to steal the throne. However, guess who leads? That's right, Ahotep the first. And so what happens is that she brought, she actually brought all the troops together as a military leader, and she personally led the fight against them. Wow, yeah, so she's in charge, right? So so mom is in charge. Uh, there is an inscription uh, that is dedicated to this event, and it, I'm going to read it to you. It goes as follows. He is the one who has accomplished the rights and taken care of Egypt. He has looked after her soldiers. She has guarded her. She has brought back her fugitives and collected together her deserters. She has pacified Upper Egypt and expelled her rebels. Wow, because of her valiant uh, actions, uh, she was given a title. Although I think it's uh, uh, an interesting title. It's called Golden Flies, Golden Flies of Valor. <laughs> her son gave her that one. Also gave her uh, a bunch of beautiful jewelry and ornamental weaponry, uh, which was later found uh, in a tomb near the Valley of the Kings. So, um, what we see, but you know, um, we have um, Ahotep's outer coffin was buried. We have found that. Uh, the coffin shows the queen with a tripartite wig and a modus. And then what happened was, we're, we're one more down. We're almost there. No one hatch upset. So here we go. One more. Now there was another called uh, another female pharaoh known as Akmos Nefertari. And she was actually the daughter of oh, Ahotep and Dao. Yeah, the daughter. And so yeah, again, we had another uh, mother daughter, or actually, it was a mother a granddaughter, but now a mother daughter situation. Uh, she was both the sister and wife of Ahmos the first, who was the founder of the 18th dynasty, and she became the mother of the second king, Amenhotep the first. But she gains a little bit even more authority, uh, and that is that she is she, she becomes well. She gains more power. We'll go over there. But she also becomes a co-regent during her son's minority and co-regent with her grandson, Tutmos uh, I, during his minority. And she just keeps living. She goes on for a long time. She has many titles uh, that she is, of course, known as the Great of Grace, the Great of Praises, King's Mother, Great King's Wife. Here's a new one. God's Wife. United with the White Crown is another one, King's Daughter and King's Sister. But she was also revered as the Goddess of Resurrection. They called her the Goddess of Resurrection. And they also called her God's Wife of Amon. Now, um, as an Amon Ra, now you can see the religious titles really starting to gain. And you can see Hatshepsut's. Uh, we'll continue this precedent where she is God's wife, the wife of Amon Ra, right? Uh, we see from a donation stele from Karnak, it shows how King Ahmos purchased the office known as the second prophet of Amun and gave this position, this position uh, as an endowment uh, to, uh, to Nefertari. 
Uh, in fact, along with land and goods and administrators. So she's in charge. Uh, she becomes a connection directly to this, this office. So, so she is very important. Also, uh, she is given uh, her own staff, uh, temple properties. Uh, she can administer her own estate. She has workshops. She has treasuries. Uh, she is clearly a person of great power uh, and prestige. And you can see, again, uh, making way and getting things ready for her. which is where we're at right now. So uh, what we've learned so far uh, in this talk is that Atomset doesn't appear autoclothonically out of nowhere. Out of the earth, she just, she just there is already a precedent of female leadership in Egypt, even in the position of Pharaoh, in all religious sense, starting to to gain uh, uh, and to be accepted in Egypt. So here we go. Well, so we have to start. We have to, we have to talk about, of course. Uh, you know, she's uh, Tutmos the first. Tutmos the first. Uh, he reigned from 1506 to 1493 BCE. Uh, he is known as a great conqueror. Uh, once again, you know, the Egyptians, they didn't stop uh, in, in Palestine, uh, in southern Palestine, defeating the Hyksos. They continued moving north, taking over much of Palestine all the way up to the area of the Jezreel Valley. Uh, but what's happening is that he's going to push a little bit further even. So he does, does conquer further south. I do want to mention that, that uh, uh, he extends Egypt down to the third cataract of the Nile. So he was able to uh, take on the king of Nubia. Uh, in fact, captured the king of Nubia and killed him. Uh, his head, by the way, was set upon the prow of his ship. Uh, and so, of course, for the next 500 years, uh, Nubia uh, happens to be part of Egypt because of him. But as he's fighting in the north, at most, uh, he is standing Egypt uh, into deep into Syro-Palestine, and he actually reaches the Euphrates River. It's all the way to Euphrates River. In fact, he even sets up a stele on the other side of the Euphrates. And then he went into the an elephant, elephant hunt. I, I never think about elephants hanging around uh, Syria, but he goes on an elephant hunt around Aleppo. And, uh, so there you have it. He was also curious because he thought that the Euphrates River was running the wrong direction. <laughs> you see, it's like, why is the water running? It's running right from, from, from wait, with north? The south, because as you all know, because, you know, the Nile River, rivers are supposed to run from, you know, uh, south to north. <laughs> you know, you know that a large portion of rivers um, flow the other way. But, oh, well, that's his experience. And Tutmos is responsible for uh, enlarging the Temple of Karnak. Uh, in fact, uh, two colossal statues stood in the hall, one with the crown of Upper Egypt and the other with the crown of Lower Egypt. Uh, uh, it was a wood pollinated uh, hallway uh, that was made out of precious wood columns uh, that were supposed to represent the papyrus marsh that's connected to the story of creation. Uh, but he only managed to change a few of these uh, into stone. There's still much of the wood at that time. This is this is the this is the setup, right? This is the context here. Now, Tutmos, uh, he was buried in the Valley of the Kings. Uh, but uh, but what happened is now we get Tutmos II. Uh, he reigned from 1493 to 1479, and he was one of the wives. Sorry, one of the wives. I'm talking about one of the. He, he was the son of one of Tutmos I's lesser wives. So uh, so once again, Tutmos II, who was the son of one of Tutmos I's lesser wives. Uh, a certain uh, Metorfet by name. And because she was very young at that time, uh, uh, what happened is that uh, uh, Tutmos 
second married his half sister Hatshepsut, who was the daughter of Tutmos the first, with his primary wife Ames. I'll say this again because we got to understand this, right? So, Tutmos the second, who reigned from 1493 to 1479, yes, uh, he was the son of Tutmos the first, right? Yes, also Hatshepsut was also the daughter of Tutmos the first. You got it? So that makes them brother and sister, but they are only half brother and half sister because uh, Tutmos the second, uh, he was married to a lesser wife of Tutmos the first, and Hatshepsut was. Uh, was the daughter of the first wife of Hatshepsut. Remember we talked about earlier about the, 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 you know, the, the lineages and how important it is when it comes to first wife and second wife. Uh, you're going to have this even in the biblical story of, uh, of you know, of Abraham, right? So, so you have it, Kurtz, right? So, uh, so there you have it. So, but the point is, is that that means that she has. Uh, some some distinction going on there. Okay, so during this period of time, um, uh, now Tutmos uh, the, the second, uh, he's Pharaoh with his wife Hatshepsut. He's putting down all these rebellions, especially the Bedouin in Palestine are causing lots of problems. Uh, now, there is, however, having said this, this is important. You gotta listen up. There is evidence to demonstrate that Tutmos I really didn't want Tutmos II to be the pharaoh. Some evidence. There's evidence that he wanted Hatshepsut to be the pharaoh instead. Uh, so now um, what happened is, is that the, and how do we know this? Because we have evidence for this belief. Now, having said that, Many Egyptologists will say, yeah, but there's a conflict there. She she wanted uh that you know she wanted to have this be true or she created this idea, and that is a possibility. But in her mortuary temple, there's an inscription that states as follows. In her mortuary temple, it says as follows. Then his majesty, I'm, I'm reading the inscription. Then his majesty said to them, This daughter of mine, Kanu Matanam Hatshepsut, may she live. I have appointed as my successor upon my throne. She shall direct the people in every sphere of the palace. It is she indeed who shall lead you. Obey her words. Unite yourselves at her command. And then I'm still reading the inscription. The royal nobles, the dignitaries, and the leaders of the people heard this proclamation of the promotion of his daughter, the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Makar. May she live eternally, unquote. Okay, so that's where I get the idea. <laughs> It's right, you know, this is a quote thing, right? So it's pretty good evidence there. At least this is her perception or the belief of some. But I have more to the story. Uh, you know, um, now it's probable that, uh, you know, during the time of Tutmos the second reign, she was, she was the real power behind the throne. She was definitely very intelligent, very well organized, as we saw later on, on her own. Uh, so she she is the brains behind everything, right? Um, now we see uh, uh, during his during his reign, uh, there's there in the Karnak Gateway, which dates from his period of time. Uh, it shows a pharaoh, but which is him, but he's side by side with his wife's sister Hatshepsut. So you can see already there's a sense of equality between the two. But then there is another image nearby 
of her standing by herself. What? Wait, what? So you have this equality of, there I am. So you can see that, um, yeah, she is the one who is more distinguished. We, we have, uh, he did, uh, of course, he did die. Um, and we do have his mummy. We have his mommy too, but we do have his mummy. Uh, and they realized that uh, he was not exactly in the best of health. Um, it, when they looked at his mummy back in 1886, um, according uh, to Gaston Mespero, he had scarcely reached the age of 30 when he fell victim to a disease of which the process of embalming could not remove the traces. The skin is scabrous in patches and covered with scars while the upper part of the skull is bald. The body is thin and somewhat shrunken and appears to have lacked vigor and muscular power. So, unquote. So he appears to be already a very weak uh, in a physical sense. Uh, and uh, but she was obviously more, more vigorous. She continued to live on. But now she had an interesting predicament. So here's the problem is that... Um, you know, while Tutmos the second lived, you know, she's she's married to the sickly boy, right? And she's the the great king's wife. But then there is a a toddler by the name of Tutmos the third, who would soon be needing a regent as soon as husband dies. Then you're gonna have to be a regent for Tutmos the third. So what's going to happen is that, um, well, she started to work on creating a stronger position for herself. That in actuality, we saw this with the inscription, in actuality, uh, she is the one that the gods favored. Now, there's another story. And here's a great story that is told. He herself told that there was a miracle that happened, a miracle. Uh, and this happened not, not, not recently, but when she was already uh, young, way back when, when she was a little girl, this happened to her, this miracle. And she reminds the general public that they themselves witnessed it too. Okay, And I'll talk about this miracle. Uh, the school, what happens is this, is that there was a great uh, public festival, and it's dedicated to Amal. During this festivity, um, which is preserved uh, and recorded in different places, right? Um, in, in the Red Chapel, it's an obelisks, you know, it's the funerary temple. Um, but still people, Egypt, Egyptologists seem divided on this. But basically the narrative tells that uh, basically the uh, um, there is this period of time where um, at the Karnak Temple uh, they're preparing for a grand procession, and the statue, the image of Amon, is supposed to perform what is called a biet, uh, b i a y t. Some people translate this as a, a miracle. Other people translate this as an oracle. Uh, it could, some people say that this actually means a revelation. But what's happened is they're supposed to take uh, this image of Amun and bring it out of, of the temple. And it's supposed to make this grand pro, uh, pronouncement. This, you know, to say what he's supposed to say, what his will is via the statue. Okay, so. The statue, or the image, I should say, is brought out, uh, being carried along with the you know, two poles, right, uh, to communicate with the people. Everybody's there to watch this, this spectacle, right? Hatshepsut tells us that, you know, that uh, this festival was different because typically when this image goes out of the temple, it makes a pronouncement. So they're all waiting for the pronouncement and nothing happens. 
They wait. They wait. There's no miracle. No bet. Nothing. Silence came across the crowd. People started to panic, started to worry. Uh, people bowed their heads down. Some started to mourn. Did Amon have nothing to say to the Egyptians, to the people? Not a word? No miracle this day? Suddenly, it is said, a great power came upon this image. And it started to whirl. And it started to move with the people who are carrying it towards the river. And then all of a sudden it stopped. And then it turned and headed towards the gate of the royal palace adjacent to Karnak. And then it swung around again as if in indecision. As if the, the, the those who are carrying the image of, of Amon were possessed. And so now it moved again. Uh, and it moved, um, as it moved, it moved uh, northward. And then suddenly it moved again, it whirled, and it moved eastward. And then finally it moved westward. And it's like, what? And this is to, to the, the, uh, the gateway called I am not from him. It's called the gateway. So just keep, so you can imagine, you know, as it's moving to and fro, the crowd like going, what, what, what? And you can imagine just running this way, and running this way, almost running in all the, the, the cardinal directions, right? And at last, as it moves through, it goes into the palace adjacent to the temple. And the God found himself in the forecourt of the palace. And upon seeing him, the story goes, Hatchem said, tells everybody they must know. They've all saw this. This is a public witness for all. Hatchet said, appeared, and she left the palace. And accordingly, she went before the image of Amon and threw herself to the ground in his presence with her arms raised up in praise. She proclaimed that uh, his, this, his, his majesty is, is great indeed, great indeed, and said that, Amo, you are my father. You are the being of all that exists, you created it all. Therefore, you are my father. Then what happens is that she became very brave in front of everybody who was there. And she asked this image of Amun that is believed to be filled with this God, what is it that you desire to happen? I will do according to all you have ordered. The God then said, uh, is said that to perform the miracle that was witnessed before everybody and communicated that, uh, that uh, basically uh, that um, she was the one to whom leadership should be given to. This is the miracle. This is the pronouncement. These are the words. In fact, what he wanted her to do uh, is that uh, he wanted her to go before his holy bark, before the, right in the front of the procession, and to go towards the great chapel of truth to, to the mutt in the temple's court. According to the story, um, she received the investor of majesty and the equipment uh, dedicating her to be, from there on out, God's wife, granting her this authority 
and also as one who is the great queen, as well as a priestess. Hatshepsut then claimed then that her power arrived directly from Avon. In this sacred pronouncement on that strange day during these festivities, you can see and, and, and you know where a lot will say, "Wow, she's using Egyptian religion, uh, especially those who are very well connected to the cult of Amon Ra, uh, for her advantage." You could say that, but then again, uh, she's appealing to the fact that this was a miracle that was seen by all. Wow, so this is the beginning of her power. So she's calling back this miracle as a child, right? And so with Tutmos II now dead, uh, his more royal sister wife, Hatshepsut, then became sole pharaoh. And she reigned from 1479 to 1458. Now we got to remember, however, is that it is most likely uh, that she was in charge from 1493 on. So, I mean, for, so, so, earlier, sorry. Um, so, um, yeah, 1493 on, so during his reign. So we just got to keep that in mind uh, that her reign is a lot longer. So you could say maybe 1493 to 1458, just saying. Um, now, she, uh, how was she as a ruler? Okay, this, of course, shows you kind of what she is. He was one of the most efficient rulers of Egypt during the entire 18th century, 18th, 18th dynasty, excuse me. Again, I'm not feeling very well, so I apologize. Um, and so what happened is, is that she ushered in this great era of peace, uh, of prosperity. Uh, according uh, to the Oracle of Amun, uh, the great creator God approved of her elevation. Uh, and said as follows. She, he declared according to an inscription, Welcome, my sweet daughter, my favorite, the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Mark Kerr Hatshepsut, thou art the Pharaoh, take possession of the two lands. You, got, you notice that she is declared a king in the masculine sense, right? So, however, we do have a problem. When Pet Books II died, there was still a possibility of another male heir to the throne. Remember Tutmos the Third. Tutmos the Third. Uh, he was the son of Iset, who was the secondary wife of Tutmos the Second. So Tutmos the Second, you know, weak as he was, did have another wife. And that wife became pregnant uh, with Tutmos III, but is still a secondary wife. We've got to keep that in mind. So what, what do you have to do? So Hatshepsut, what she did is she adopted Tutmos III as her own son. So making her both uh, his uh, stepmom and his aunt. And of course, obviously, because Tutmos III was way too young to rule, uh, he, he was a baby at this time, right? Uh, uh, she became assigned as the regent. Now, according to uh, ancient biography, yeah, we have it uh, from Eneni. Uh, this person was an important official at the time. Uh, it was agreed upon that there was little doubt who fully took on the reins of power at this time. Um, he says as follows. He, uh, Tutmos uh, III, went to heaven, sorry, I'm sorry, he, sorry, Tutmos II, went to heaven, and he joined with the gods. His son stood in his place as king of the two lands as he ruled upon the throne of the one who begot him. His, the Tutmos II's sister, the god's wife, Hatshepsut, was doing the affairs of the two lands with her plans. One worked for her, Egypt with bowed head. And already you can see there's a, there's a change going on. It's happened. She's already 
showing that she is the one who is definitely more powerful than Tutmos the third. Of course, Tutmos the third can't do much. That most of the infants. But eventually, uh, of course, now it's her son. What happens is that Hatshepsut decided to claim the power of Pharaoh directly for herself. Um, and so what she did is started to minimize her stepson's role in leadership. And it continued to the, the decline until the very time of her death, at which point then suddenly he becomes full Pharaoh in his own right. Uh, now there was a very, there's a lot of support for her power. And there's lots of, lots of questions about this. Some would say that uh, those who are in charge want her to rule because uh, Tutmos III was a, a questionable choice for many, and that there are many other or other possible options to rule instead. So that was that was the thought. And so that too was the stable choice. They also had a lot of confidence in her because she ruled very well during the time of, of Tutmos uh, the, the second. That she was, they all knew that she was a power behind the throne, so to speak. And so they didn't want somebody uh, like Tutmos the third. Uh, obviously, he's too young to rule. They wanted her, and she was extremely organized. So what is she going to do? Well, of course, a lot of things that she does uh, is that she is going to rebuild Egypt. It is still a complete mess after the Hyksos. And she focuses in on that. Now, Hatch upset uh, one thing, another thing that is mentioned of her in Egyptian records is that she was one who was very able to delegate. She was a great delegator. She saw talent when she saw it. And so what she did is she found the very best people for the job to help her rule and to rule uh, in an efficient way. Uh, so uh, she did a lot of delegation. Uh, and I like that about her. So, uh, first of all, she put a certain um, Senemut, uh, Senemut uh, that became her lead administrator, that became her steward. And so he was in charge. Senemut was in charge of, of much of what goes on in the palace, but he was also in charge of her daughter's Neferu's household as well. Uh, he came from a, a very humble background. We don't know uh, if he had any family to speak of. Uh, certainly, there's no references uh, to any any children. He didn't have a apparently he didn't have a wife. Um, you know, but there is some questions. And Karakuni, as well as many other Egyptologists, have thought to themselves that maybe beyond his administrative administrative roles uh, that uh, he may have been uh, her uh, her lover there. Um, and there's some evidence uh, to show that, although uh, some of it's not, I mean, obviously, uh, there, is, there, there may be fine at this time uh, from a tomb above Deir al-Bahiri, uh, a woman being taken from behind uh, that some have read that this is Hatchup set and being submitted to uh, a lover. Some have understood this as Senemut, uh, and she's placed in a subservient position, uh, but uh, we're not sure about this. And again, it could just be any graffiti. However, having said that, we do have a lot of evidence that shows that uh, uh, he talked of her in a very affectionate way, uh, that there's obvious um, a, a care between the two of them, uh, that we see there, that she did, uh, you know, they took care of each other, and the fact uh, that they had matching coffins. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, their two sarcophagi uh, were designed uh, that looked exactly the same. Uh, they were made as a pair. <laughs> uh, even though they're different locations, uh, there seemed to be something there, but uh, there's more. We'll go there. But, uh, that's one administrator. Another important official was an elderly Ahmos uh, Penequit, uh, who had a lot of authority <coughs> early on in her reign. 
and he was head of all her finances of Egypt, inclusive of the royal treasury. Uh, and uh, he was also uh, her daughter, uh, Neferu's uh, tutor. Uh, he did arrive from a wealthy background, a uh, wealthy family near Thebes. And so there you have it. Um, now, five years into her reign, Hatshepsut uh, found another man uh, to be in a high position in her court. Uh, that name is Userman, U S E R A M E N. You don't think it's something to say, Userman. Userman. And, and he became her vizier in the south. Now, uh, he also acted as the queen's lieutenant in all areas of Powell's administration. Uh, he was in charge also uh, when it came to aspects of the finances. Uh, she, he helped her with military strategy. Uh, his main position was at Thebes. And so he was in charge of the various military campaigns going on in the South. Now, why is this important? And it is important is, is typically uh, during this period of time, uh, Tutmos III would achieve various positions. And what happened is those positions that that uh, Tutmos III would typically receive didn't go to him. It went instead to the vizier. So the vizier assumed these positions, which of course made again Tutmos III uh, placing him into a very weakened position, a lesser position, because she was the one in charge. Now, uh, we see already by the second year of her reign, uh, when she was you know, appointed, appointed regent over Tutmos III, that she was um, setting herself up to be um, a complete ruler. Uh, we see this uh, first evidence, for example, uh, in a relief that was carved, ca ca excuse me, at the Sama Temple in Nubia that year. And it shows her, it displays her, she's amongst the gods. Uh, it describes her various attributes. She's understood as a, a builder, uh, a ritual officiate, right? Uh, and she's giving, given names that apply to a masculine king in this inscription already in the second year of her reign. Uh, accordingly, the goddess Satet, the guardian of the Nubian southern lands, says as follows about her. It's, uh, um, so the goddess says, she is the daughter who has come forth from your limbs. With a loving heart, you have raised her, for she is your loving daughter. And so uh, there you have that. So uh, Hatshepsut is given various titles, this inscription. She's God's wife, king, king's great wife. Uh, but uh, she's also getting other uh, positions. She's given other authority, as you see, already from this inscription. Then that very same year, Hatshepsut ordered two grand obelisks for the Karnak Temple. And uh, and so once again, uh, there is another inscription that we're going to be looking at that was carved on the island of Sahel along Aswan. Uh, this is near the site where the masonry, where the stone for the great obelisk came from. Now, what's interesting uh, is that this text uh, is is um, uh, inscribed by Senebut. Yes, remember? So, remember Senate Mut? So, here we have once again uh, Senate Mut, uh, the administrator, uh, who she's very close to. Uh, and uh, here is uh, the inscription. So, this is what he says. He says, uh, calls her the princess, the one great of praise and charm. I'm reading it right now. Great of love, the one to whom Ra has given the kingship in truth amongst the Aeneid, king's daughter, king's sister, God's wife, great king's wife, Hatshepsut, 
May she live, beloved Asatet, Lady of Elephant Pine, beloved Kunim, Lord of the First Cataract of the region. Now, um, is it me, or, or, or do you sense uh, just a little bit uh, in the way uh, of, of affection there? Uh, let's just uh, keep on going there, right? Okay, so what will happen here is soon after this inscription, uh, the block from the Karnak Temple uh, reveals uh, Hatshepsut. She's wearing the gown uh, of a queen that's on her body. However, she has the crown of a king on her head. We saw this before. I mentioned this before. So there is a precedent for it. So, so she's wearing what's called the Atev crown. Uh, it's a mixture of, of ram's horns and all double plumes. Uh, and she is wearing a very short masculine wig. So it looks like almost a masculine hair. Uh, you can imagine, it's like, wait, this, there's not the long locks, it's the short locks of a male, right? And you see here, and of course, um, uh, there is other things too that indicate there are some pages going on. Now, as I said before, while Othmos I had focused uh, his efforts on defeating the Hyksos, and Tutmos I uh, had concentrated his efforts in strengthening uh, Egypt's military by expanding uh, the conquest through Syro-Palestine to the Euphrates. Hatshepsut is known as the pharaoh who reestablished all the trade networks that were disturbed during the second intermediate period during the time uh, of the Hyksos. And so her period of rule was a time of great economic growth. Uh, one of her uh, trade expeditions uh, that she oversaw was to a place called Punt. Um, now, uh, she went there and um, with five vessels, each 70 feet long. And uh, by the way, Punt is approximately where Somalia is today, which is along the Red Sea. And they brought back many exotic goods. So obviously, uh, various precious metals, gold, uh, ebony, uh, of course, uh, animals, uh, baboons, animal skins, but precious to her, 31 live myrrh trees, myrrh trees, you know, myrrh, like incense and myrrh, right? Uh, and she planted those trees in the courtyard before her elaborate mortuary temple. Uh, in fact, uh, there's there's part of the stuff that's still there to this day, right? Now, um, you know, there is, of course, uh, there's a story about this excursion there located, uh, along with a very uh, realistic depiction of Queen Itia Punt. So, uh, so here we have a uh, hatch upset. Uh, it was one of the great builders of ancient Egypt. She left many monuments behind. In fact, uh, I have to tell, tell you that she, there's so many statues of her. It's almost like Ramses of the second. There's so many statues of her that it's hard to find like a museum, a major museum that doesn't have some kind of image of her, right? Uh, she built uh, many uh, structures, especially at Karnak. Uh, for example, the, the precinct of the goddess Mut, at Karnak, uh, as I said before, there's so much in the way of damage that was created by the Hyksos. Uh, it was still damaged during her reign. So what she did is she rebuilt uh, this particular temple. Uh, she erected twin monument obelisks before the entrance of the temple of Karnak. And so uh, there you have it. Uh, in a place known as Beni Hassan, located in Upper Egypt, uh, Hatshepsut built an underground temple that was dedicated uh, to the goddess by the name of Pocket. Pocket. So she was into especially the worship of a goddess by the name Pocket. Who is Pocket? Pocket is a combination between two 
lion or cat deities. Sekhmet, who connects to Upper Egypt, and Bast, who connects to Lower Egypt. And so uh, Akhet was a combination between these two and was worshipped, interestingly enough, in the region between the two. It became, she became very popular. And this was a goddess that was near and dear to the heart uh, of Hatshepsut. So, uh, so I have to say that Packet, you know, wasn't as, as, as how do I say it, uh, uh, bloodthirsty uh, and ferocious uh, as Sekhmet. However, uh, definitely not uh, as domesticated uh, as, as Bastet, right? What does the name Paquette mean? It means she who snatches or tears, right? Uh, now, of Paquette, one of the coffin texts declares as follows about her. O you of the dawn who wake and sleep, O you who are in Lipness, dwelling after time in Nidet, I have appeared as Packet, the great, whose eyes are keen and whose claws are sharp, the lioness who sees and catches by night. So very much like a, a desert lynx, right? Uh, in fact, one of her epithets were she was called a night huntress with sharp eyes and pointed claw. Uh, but uh, what happens is that, uh, uh, so she was definitely ideal. Uh, she was called upon during times of war. Uh, so she was called upon, but she was also called upon during times of peace. She worked either way. So, you know, which I find is interesting. Uh, but that, uh, what happened is this, is that uh, because of the past that aspect, she was very protective of her young, but she's also protective of mothers, but in a fierce and ferocious way, right? So it's kind of an interesting uh, combination, right? Uh, they call her the goddess of the mouth of the Wadi or she who opens the ways of the stormy rains. Uh, that's because the, this worship came about uh, in this region where there's all these wadis. These are like dry riverbeds along hills that when it rains, suddenly it's filled with water and <laughs> rushes down and causes destruction. Much like, right, Paquette would do. Uh, so Paquette was also declared as she who has great magic which is the epithet that's shared by Isis and Hathor. And so she's connected with these two as well. So this is the, the goddess uh, who Hatshepsut will focus upon, will worship, right? And so uh, now the temple itself, it a dedicated packet that's created by Hatshepsut. It was a great underground complex that you can visit today. Uh, it's four grand chambers. I mean, there are catacombs, uh, but they are filled with mummified cats. Uh, they were brought from all over Egypt and dedicated to her. Uh, these are forms of Bast and Sekhmet. Uh, Hatshepsut states the following from an inscription discovered in this shrine. It goes as follows. Paquette the Great, uh, who traverses the valleys uh, in the midst uh, of the Eastland, whose ways are storm beaten. I made her temple with that which was due to her Aeneid of gods. So it sounds like here, of course, Hatshepsut is talking here. The doors were of acacia wood with bronze at the seasons. The priest knew this, her city. I made divine their temples, furnished with that which comes forth. The offering table has wrought with silver and gold, chest of linen, every vessel that abides in the place. 
So again, this is Paquette, right? Dedicated to Paquette. And Hatshepsut saying this, by the way, if you're wanting to know, spelling is spelled P-A-K-H-E-T. That's Paquette. So it's a mixture between Sekhmet and Bastet. And so this is the dedication that we found uh, from Hatshepsut, because, you know, she is the royal mother, right? And so, you know, who's protective, especially of her daughter, which we'll talk about in a few seconds. And you can see uh, why she can relate with Paquette, because Paquette combines aspects of upper as well as lower Egypt as a goddess. And that's exactly what Hatshepsut wants to do. She wants to be the unifier of also upper and lower Egypt. So you can see how this is a natural connection. Now, uh, later on, by the way, uh, this particular uh, uh, underground area uh, under the Ptolemies was renamed Speos Artemidos, uh, which means cave of Artemis. For Paquette became understood by the Greeks as a hunter uh, and connected with the great goddess of the moon and hunt. As you can see, so Paquette connects with Artemis. Now, near the great underground temple, they get dedicated to the goddess Paquette. Hatshepsut built uh, a second smaller temple to Paquette as well. But this time, this temple was both in her name and in the name of her daughter, Neferu, uh, who was, of course, uh, the daughter of Tutmos II and was uh, duly uh, married to Tutmos III. Okay, so when uh, Hatshepsut was elevated to Pharaoh after the death of Tutmos II, she gave her title, God's wife, to Amun, and she gave it to her daughter. And as a result, she made her daughter, Neferu, the high priestess of the cult of Amun, because now, you know, obviously, uh, Hatshepsut is now the Pharaoh, right? Uh, according uh, to the local Theban myth, Pharaoh was supposed to be the offspring of a human mother and the great invisible creator god Amun himself. Uh, this, was, this was a Theban idea, uh, but uh, there you have it. But what's going to happen is something kind of off, off, awkward. Let's here we go. So now his, her, her daughter, her daughter is in the role of God's wife of Amun. So, uh, so Neferu is now depicted uh, in her mother's red chapel of Karnak. Uh, she's shown as performing the ritual ceremony with the priest that appears to be connected with uh, destroying the names of their enemies. Yeah, if you want to defeat somebody, what you do is you destroy their names. And by destroying their names, you destroy them. It's, you know, obviously this magic aspect. Uh, what happens is Hatshepsut uh, also, we know, also gave Neferu two other titles, that of Lady of Upper and Lower Egypt, and the second one is Mistress of the Lands. Now, what happened here is, uh, what about Tutmos III? I mean, after all, Neferu is Tutmos III's wife, right? Because he, he made him marry him, you know? So what's going to happen there? So what she did is something very strange. So what happened is in the various ceremonies where it's supposed to be uh, Neferu, you know, that is officiating with her husband, you know, who's of course supposed to be the Pharaoh. He's not there, but Hatshepsut takes on the role of the male pharaoh with her daughter. <laughs> so she played the part of a husband while her daughter was put into the strange position of acting as her mother's wife. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you see, that was the third story. I'm not going to like this too much. Like, wow, I'm really being demoted here. <laughs> it's like, I was like, she's taking my place. <laughs> so 
uh, so hatch of set. Uh, yeah, so there you have it. Oh man, I, I tell you, uh, I, do you, you, you sense that most of third is definitely uh, put off to the side or not, right? But he, she is accentuating uh, the power of, 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 of her daughter. So, uh, and what you think is, so she, so, so you do have now these two women rising to uh, so much power. Now, Hatshepsut um, also occurs, created for great mortuary temple complex. It's located on the west side of the Nile near Deir al-Bahiri. Uh, it's very, it's a giant. I mean, it's a giant complex. Uh, the, the focus architecturally uh, is on the uh, on the what's called the Holy of Holies, uh, the Digiter Disaru, which is a grand colonnaded mortuary temple resting upon two colonnaded terraces and reached via a very long ramp, traversing them with a sharp cliff behind it. Each of the terraces was accented by an elaborate, well watered garden. When Hatshepsut created her uh, this funerary temple around 1480 uh, BCE, she wished to create a representation of the realm of paradise of Amal, and that there would be these terrace gardens uh, that connect to this, this idyllic realm, right? This was a place for the sun god on earth. Now, uh, remember the myrrh trees? The myrrh trees were then brought from this expedition to put in place there. Uh, myrrh was very important. So now myrrh uh, is, is, is uh, obviously because a major commodity of Egypt, but also they're called two Persia trees. Persia trees. These are planted on either side of the main entrance. Connect with, and the Persia trees uh, are connected to the realm of the underworld. In fact, the um, uh, they're called the Ishtip. Uh, it's the, the, the fruit is it's, it's pear shaped. It's connected to the avocado. Uh, the branches of the Persia were often part of funerary um, um, bouquets and represented the sacred heart of Horus. So, um, but uh, anyway, but it's also connected in many ways uh, to the tree of life. So we will see, in fact, uh, there are images where Ra splits the Ishtad tree, uh, representing uh, the tree of life. Uh, in the morning after his victory over his enemies. And so you're seeing this there. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a very, very much a, a sacred tree. There's even um, uh, the idea that uh, the phoenix, when it rises from the ashes, Sometimes it arises from the Persia tree. And so uh, the ashes of the Persia tree, which is again the tree of life, but is also the tree of the underworld. So two of these are placed before her temple. Well, okay, so um, now because um, I do want to say that uh, because of the yellow coloring of the truth, the Persia tree was often associated with the sun and so also had solar connections, especially with Ra. According to the Book of Ani, Ra was portrayed as a cat hanging about a Persia tree that represents the tree of life. And the inscription, I love this inscription, I have to read it to you, but uh, it goes as follows. I am the cat which fought near the Persia tree in Anu on the night when the foes of Nebertur were destroyed. Who is this cat? This male cat is Ra himself, and he was called Mao, as a meow, because of the speech of the god Sa, who said concerning him, he is like Mao unto that which he hath made. Therefore did the name of Ra become Mao. As concerning the fight which took place near the Persia tree in Anu, these words have reference to the slaughter of children of rebellion, when righteous retribution was meted out, yada yada. I just think it's like so you, so you think of Ra, you think of Ra being Mao. Now, Ra the cat hanging around the, the Persia tree, right? <laughs> so, uh, so this tree again 
was sacred, but also sacred to Hatshepsut. So we are learning a lot about Hatshepsut, the goddesses, uh, the goddess specifically that she worships, Paket, which she considers very important when it comes to symbols. Let's let's conclude with her. Let's go. Okay, so now Hatshepsut. Let's take a look at her. Oh, we're looking at the mortuary temple. Uh, and we, we take a look, and Hatshepsut is depicted in full pharaonic regalia, making offerings to Horus. Uh, the staff of Osiris stands to her left. Uh, she, at, by this time when the temple is built, she is fully pharaoh. But uh, let's go into a little backdrop here. Uh, now, Hatshepsut took on all the regalia and symbols assumed by the male pharaohs. Without exception, she took them all on eventually. Uh, she even took on uh, the Chinbite kilt, so she wore a kilt. She had the cot headcloth with the uraeus, and yes, she even wore the false beard itself. Uh, in these depictions, Atchipsut's breasts are typically covered, uh, her arms uh, being crossed holding the two staffs of the two kingdoms. But Hatshepsut still, at first, wasn't sure how to depict herself. Should she depict herself as female or male? And she experimented with both early on. So she wasn't sure. So the early years of her reign, it typically shows her wearing a long dress of a woman, but she has the crown of a king on her head. At some point, uh, she realized that she needed to change these images. So she widened, she had her shoulders widened and extended stance of her legs. So, you know, that seemed to give her more of a powerful figure, um, you know, and, uh, and so she's shown as being active. Well, then... Um, but she still wants to retain at first uh, her female core. So uh, she's still wearing uh, a dress. But then she decides that maybe I should go shirtless. So she goes shirtless like many of the pharaohs. So she's bare chested in some images like a man. Well, but she doesn't reduce her breasts. So you could see that she has breasts that are showing. So she's not getting rid of the breasts, but she's being bare-chested like a man. But eventually, uh, the images will change. And so uh, she'll, along with the broad shoulders of a boy, uh, the breasts will slowly evolve into pectoral muscles. Uh, and so the breasts will, will eventually disappear. Uh, in the first years of her reign, uh, she showed herself uh, sometimes in the form of Osiris, but what I find is interesting there is that uh, this Osiris still has feminine uh, characteristics, a dainty chin, a uh, heart-shaped face, so you see that. And uh, now what I find is interesting is that typically women were depicted as yellow in paintings, and men were depicted in red, but what happened is that her as far as the Osiris figures are concerned, it kind of got, how do I put this? It was a stri strange blending of red and yellow. And so some of the images, images look like they're, they're orange. <laughs> you have these orange Osiris, <laughs> so, uh, which represents, uh, in a sense, her. I think it's interesting that she took on Osiris as a connection, not Isis. So, right. But uh, eventually, uh, as time goes on, uh, Hatshepsut uh, will be displayed as completely male in almost every regard and shown uh, as you know, with manly courage and leading various campaigns, uh, fighting against the enemies and, and destroying uh, the evildoers and extending out Egypt. And, uh, you know, Hatshepsut uh, then is shown as completely as just any pharaoh, right? So she went all in in every single way. 
except now about her pronoun. So she was still described as a shirt, she or as a her. However, in some cases, uh, she will be called the son of Ra, as well as the daughter of Ra. And there are a few occasions where she will take on uh, the masculine uh, he. And of course, always uh, being king of, of, of Egypt. So, you know, um, so he who belongs uh, to the sedge plants and the bee, you know. So now, so, 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 so she becomes full pharaoh in every regards. And once again, we're back to, well, I mean, is this the patriarchy? Is this, you know, she's losing her femininity? But then again, you have this whole idea of, oh, yeah, but she's also uh, taking on a role. She's taking on a position, a traditional position of all the regalia. And yet, I don't feel that she has lost her femininity in any way. But we do have her mother. Uh, in 2007, uh, DNA analysis uh, uh, identified it beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, there was actually, what happened is this, uh, is that the, uh, there's a fragment of a hip and a femur uh, from the mummy revealing a direct connection to a mummy of another female royal relative and a CT scan of a single tooth that was placed in a box with Hatshepsut's name. So from that, we're able to identify the mummy. Yeah, so there you have a tooth there. It has the name Hatshepsut. You open it up, there's a tooth. So you get the DNA and going, hey, guess what? So from uh, this, this fragment of a hip femur from another mummy and from uh, this tooth, we're able to identify the body. What does the body look like? By the way, the tooth fit directly into the socket, right into her mummy's jaw. Well, looking at the inspection, we realized in real life she had the typical overbite, pronounced overbite, that you see of many of the pharaohs of this particular dynasty. So um, uh, her nail polish was black and red. The female uh, pharaoh was overweight. Uh, there are many skin legions on her. Uh, and she had extensive tooth decay. Also, there's indication that she had an insulin problem, and a lot of people uh, have diagnosed that she did have well, diabetes uh, as a result of what looks like poor eating habits. Uh, she also had a skin disease uh, known as alopecia, uh, being bald in front, uh, but she had hair kind of growing in back there. And the age of her death was around 50 years of age. But she, again, was considered a great pharaoh. Uh, regardless of male or female, she was great in her own right. After her death, got to conclude, Hatch of Set, uh, after her death, you got, remember Tutmos III? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Tutmos III, yeah. Uh, well, uh, as soon as she died, he became uh, pharaoh. Uh, and uh, he reigned for another 30 years. Uh, he became known as a great conqueror. Uh, towards the end of his reign, he started destroying and erasing uh, her inscriptions and her contributions. He even moved her mummy to another location. Some people think oh, that was the third. was probably pretty mad about how he was treated uh, <laughs> by Hatchet Set. But others say no. No, uh, what happens is that he's trying to make way for his own um, uh, uh, claimant by the name of Amar Kotep IV as Pharaoh. He didn't want to have any rival uh, people who claim, and so he's clearing this all out so his so he can rule instead. And so there you have it. So so is is she the last one? Of course not. She's not the last female Pharaoh. Do we have more? We don't, have, we don't have any more time, but yeah, we have quite a bit more. And of course, obviously, Nefertiti was a co-pharaoh of Akhenaten later on, right? Uh, and she was the first wife, and she attained uh, exactly the same kinds of powers and regalia, uh, and they used her names interchangeably. And so she was 
She was uh, a pharaoh. Uh, and of course, we know that now that we know that she kept living longer than we thought, as evidence uh, from an archaeologist in Leuven, we thought that she died earlier, but turns out that she lived a longer period of time, and though that she was indeed a soul pharaoh too, and that was Nefer Neferatum, who ruled from 1334 to 1332. That was actually Nefertiti, and her reign continued on into, as a sole ruler after a Kananatan. And then, of course, you have uh, Tasseret, 1197 to 1189, uh, uh, you know, uh, B, uh, BCE. And then uh, later on, when the Ptolemies take over, of course, you've got Cleopatra the first, the right, you know, uh, and Cleopatra the, the second, and, and moving on. And of course, obviously, eventually, we're going to get uh, to Cleopatra the third and Bernice the third, and uh, and of course, Cleopatra the seventh, uh, of course, who's the famous Cleopatra that we all know and love so well. So Hatshepsut is just only one of so many female pharaohs to hold the throne of Egypt and to bear the royal regalia in complete equality. And of course, that continues on all the way uh, to Cleopatra VII, which is the end of the Pharaonic line. And so I find it interesting that you find uh, female pharaohs all the way back at the beginning of the line of the pharaohs and at the very end. And you can see that, that this is a great way to understand how Egypt viewed not only uh, the pharaohs, but also women in general in Egypt. Thank you very much. And have a great night.